Hey, welcome to our uh, Wednesday evening Bible class uh, with Stewart Church of Christ. Uh, we are going to be in Exodus chapter 24 uh, tonight. If you have been a part of this study, you know, last week we covered three chapters, and tonight we don't really have that many verses at all to cover, so we may be pretty quick. Uh, but we're going chronologically through the Bible, and at this point in time, uh, the descendants of Abraham have been led out of captivity. Moses is serving as kind of a mediator between Israel and God and, and leading them. And they have made it to this place uh, called Mount Sinai, which is where really the account began anyway, because that's where Moses was when he saw the burning bush and God told him to go back into Egypt to get uh, Israel. And so they made it back to Sinai and uh, they have been there for some time. Before it's over, they'll be there approximately two years uh, before they'll move on. And the, the, the what's happening during that time frame of those two years is the giving of God is organizing them as a nation, giving them a law, set, establishing their worship toward him and all of the elements of that, uh, and preparing them to uh, follow him to the land of Canaan, uh, trying to develop their faith even so that they can follow him to that place. And in our last couple of classes, especially chapter 20, we, if you're a part of it, that we studied through the Ten Commandments, which was the foundation for uh, the law of Moses. Many people call it the Decalogue because it has 10 uh, commandments, uh, but all it is is a foundation. It is not the law. The law is built upon that foundation. Each one of those, those commandments is kind of a category, and so as you continue on uh, throughout the remainder or the latter part of the book of Exodus, you kind of fill in the blanks, and the book of Leviticus as well. You fill in the blanks as to how each one of those categories is to be uh, fulfilled by the people before God. And so in chapters 22, 21, 22, and 23, uh, last week we started to see some of those spaces filled in by how Israel was responsible to treat each other, to treat their neighbors, to treat property of others, what they were to do about their own property and things of that nature, how they were to treat those people who were in need of justice. Uh, there were even some capital punishment issues uh, God dealt with how they were supposed to deal with the land and dealing with those who were uh, had to sell themselves to a servanthood situation, how to deal with all of that, as well as how to deal with the strangers in the nations that were around them. And so as we get into chapter 24, we're at this place where now Israel is being challenged uh, to say whether or not they're going to be a part of this. You know, a covenant is between two entities. You can't have uh, one entity turn to another and say, okay, you have to be in this covenant with me. It just doesn't work that way. Uh, both sides have to agree to be a part of this in order for uh, it to be a proper covenant. And so when you get to chapter 24, it's Israel's place to finally say, okay, whether or not we're going to be a part of this, we'll, we'll choose and we'll, they confirm that with God. Uh, also at this point, we see the elements get into place that are necessary in order for God to continue to expound upon what it means to follow this law and how they are to do it and all of the details of, of being his people. And, and then we'll move on following that to the specifics about items and all of that. But tonight, in this class in chapter 24 of the book of Exodus, we're dealing with the entrance to the covenant with Israel, uh, between Israel and God, and the things necessary to put Moses in a place where God could, could finish all of it. It's, it's really kind of a summary chapter. Do you have anything to add before we start reading? No, I think the one thing that we might need to remember is the fact that when God began delivering the law, or when he began speaking with Israel, he was speaking to them as a whole. And we've now transitioned into a place where God is speaking directly to Moses. Right, right. Okay, chapter 24, Exodus chapter 24. Now he said to Moses, come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and worship from Afar. Now, if we stop there just a second, we have some names that are significant that come up that really aren't mentioned very often in the scriptures. Uh, now, of course, we know Moses and we know Aaron, uh, his brother, uh, because Aaron has been selected to work with Moses to be his spokesperson. And he's also uh, serving as a priest and his descendants, they have not been designated as this yet, but his descendants are going to be the line of priests that will serve this nation as they continue to move forward. Two of those sons are listed here, Nadab and Abihu. Now, later we learn that they uh, failed God. 
and that they failed the people in their actions before him, but that's later. At this point in time, they're being ratified as a part of this covenant to, to serve God and to take the people to God. That was the job of a priest. A prophet had the job of taking God's message to the people. A priest had the job of taking the people to God. And so God calls Moses here uh, and Aaron. And of course, Aaron can't do this by himself. And so Nadab, Nadab, Nadab and Abihu, his sons, uh, also go with him. And then 70 of the elders of Israel come. And they're supposed to be worshiping God here before they can come into his presence. But it cannot happen in a close environment yet. Uh, and the primary reason is they have not yet been a part of this covenant and they have not yet uh, been sanctified by blood, which will come in just a little while. Uh, but just, just recognize here that Moses and Aaron and Nadab and Abihu and 70 of the leaders of Israel are called out of the people to come closer to the mountain to meet with God. Yeah, I think just to visualize this, we need to understand that God isn't calling Nadab and Abihu, Aaron and the elders, into his intimate presence, but he is telling them to approach the mountain that his presence is sitting on at this time. That although Moses will obviously has been closer to God, has been in the presence of God, Nadab and Abihu and the elders are still welcomed into some sort of covenant relationship at this point. That this is the beginning of something. This is, yeah, this is the beginning. Okay, verse 2. And Moses alone shall come near the Lord, but they shall not come near, nor shall the people go up with him. So Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments. And all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words which the Lord has said, we will do. So Moses is, is preparing Aaron Nadab and Abihu, and they have pulled 70 of the elders of Israel out, and they are preparing to go to the mountain. And before they do that, Moses turns to the people and challenges them to make a decision. Uh, truthfully, that's what following God is always about. It's about being at this place where you have to make a decision. And I hear people all the time say things like, you know, I just don't want to do this right now. I'm, I don't want to make a decision today, or when I get older, or when life gets simpler, and the bottom line is, every day we're called to make a decision who we're going to be today. And so before Moses leaves them and takes their leaders with him, he turns to the people to see what decision are they going to make. Are you going to choose to, to enter into this relationship with God and follow him the way that he desires or not? And the people say, again, even before they know everything about it, they say, we're going to do whatever it is that God asks us to do. Yeah, right here we have Moses asking the people of Israel to dedicate their lives to God. The same sort of dedication that we are asked to make to Christ and to God the Father and his word, Moses is asking them to make right here in this instance. And I, I don't think it's too bold to say that Israel was a little overconfident in this time with their response. But nonetheless, it's very admirable. Yeah, and... And by the way, uh, you know, they, they don't have a Bible before them that they can read and follow, right? They're getting it while this is going. And so before Moses leaves, once they've said they're going to follow, he's going he's to make it possible for them to know what to do. Before, when they had a, something they didn't understand, they went to Moses. But he's not going to be there. So there's something more. Verse 4. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord, and he rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. And then he sent young men of the children of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half the blood and put it in basins and half the blood he sprinkled on the altar. Now stop there just a second. Uh, so we have several steps being taken because of Israel's response to God saying, we're going to do what he asked us to do. And the first step is writing. Moses writes down what God has done them to this point. Uh, there are a lot of things still to come, you know, the, the tabernacle, the different altar uh, settings and items around the altar, and all of that's going to happen. But they need to know what to do in the meantime. And so Moses writes it down, and he turns to the people, and he pulls some young men out to serve at least temporarily, because, again, we don't have a, there's no tribe of Levi just yet. So he pulls these young men out to make sacrifices before God, and the point of the sacrifices have to do with the people entering this covenant. You know, they're going to approach God now 
in worship. And they can because of this covenant. And the blood from these sacrifices, it, it, they're all prepared at pillar representing each one of the descendant tribes. And, and the blood's going to represent uh, their worship. And the blood is going to be necessary to get them into this covenant. And the blood is going to make it possible for them to approach God because it's the way that God has set up this system. I don't want to get off topic, but the same thing is true in the New Testament. You can, you can go through acts of worship. But that does not make that worship acceptable to God if you have not been ratified by blood. You can say, I honor God. You can say, I want to be with God. But unless there's blood involved, you're not in that ability, in that place where you can approach him. Uh, now, the new covenant's different. That blood is contacted by God applying it when we are immersed into the death of his son, Romans 6 through 5. But in this old covenant, they had physical sacrifices that represented all of that. And so through this, uh, the people can now approach God in worship. God wanted his covenant written down because he knew that if he had left it up to human memory and verbal, letting it being passed down verbally and human interpretation, that it wouldn't take long for it to get perverted to where every single Israelite has their own individual understanding of what their covenant with God is. In the same way, in the New Testament, we have the New Covenant. It's written down for the same reason, so that we can't take it and try to apply it to our lives in a way that is different than it is for somebody else. Yeah, yeah I can't come up with my own way. <laughs> All right, verse 7. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. And Moses took the blood, sprinkled it on the people, and said, Behold the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you according to all these words. So he writes it down. He reads it to them and asks them again to make a commitment. And they do. And then he uses that blood from the sacrifices to ratify the covenant. In other words, they don't even know all of the law. They don't even know where they're going to go with all of this. But what they know is they want to be in the covenant. And so the blood makes it possible for them to be in the covenant. Just like our covenant, their covenant was sealed with a blood sacrifice. Okay, verse 9. Then Moses went up, also Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and they saw the God of Israel. And there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire stone, and it was like the very heavens in its clarity. But on the nobles of the children of Israel, he did not lay his hand or stretch out his hand. So they saw God and they ate and drank. Now, I'm going to tell you before I talk about this, I don't have a full understanding of what we just read. And there's a reason for that. Because God doesn't explain it all to us. It's interesting to me that we know that God is not flesh and blood. And yet we know that there are times that God has appeared to man. Uh, especially during the Old Testament times, in a physical way. And that's because man does not have the ability to comprehend God without comprehending him in the limitations of what is around us. And, and that even comes into play when you get to the New Testament, and especially in the book of Revelation, when you have John in chapter 1, and he's standing there, and he hears, he hears this voice behind him like, like trumpet and waters. And he turns around to see, and he sees one like like the Son of Man, and he gives a description, but that's not a description that is literally what Jesus was like. It was a representation of some way. So, so these men stand before God, Moses, Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 elders of Israel. They stand before God, and they see him, yet God does not stretch out his hand, meaning they don't die. They see some kind of a representation of God, yet they do not die. And the only explanation for that is they have just been ratified with this blood. They are, they are in this covenant. And so after the confirmation of the covenant between them and God, they see God. And, and basically the only thing that the text gives us that they can describe is the fact that underneath him is purity of waters. Now, I don't want to get too deep, but when you get into apocalyptic literature, which is in many places in the Old Testament, and certainly in Matthew 24, as well as other chapters, but especially the book of Revelation, you find that oftentimes water is used to, uh, to, to represent mankind. 
uh, whether it be a nation or nations, people or peoples, it represents a group of, of mankind. And so I think what we're being told here is that God is now reigning over his people and they are pure as that blue crystal, uh, I would say Caribbean water. Uh, and that represents this nation that now stands before God in righteousness because they're in this covenant that they were ratified into by the blood. Yeah. Um, again, I'll preface this with, I don't understand a lot of it, but I do know that, um, their description of God is echoed in Isaiah's description of the throne of God in Isaiah six, also in Ezekiel one, it's very similar. Ezekiel even goes on to say that God's throne is sit seated over a crystal waters. So again, we see that water imagery, that clear crystal blue water. It's also very reminiscent, like you said, of John's description in Revelation, that whatever they're seeing, this is a consistent image of God that God has presented to humans throughout the course of his teachings, throughout the course of the Bible, that this isn't a one-off circumstance. What that means, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I also find it intriguing here that after they, they see this vision, it says that they ate and drank. I, I see that kind of as a fellowship issue. They are standing before God and they are participating, I think, kind of in a type anti-type scenario as we do when we worship God today and we partake of the Lord's Supper. It's a fellowship with each other and also in the presence of, of God. Do you want to add anything before we read? No. <laughs> okay. Verse uh, 12. Then the Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and be there, and I will give you tablets of stone and the law and commandments which I have written that you may teach them. So now God says to Moses, all right, now you're different. You know, that we, we read earlier about the Nadab, Abihu, Aaron, the 70 could come with Moses. So the people were further out. But even now it's going to change even further. They can't come closer either. Only Moses can come closer and they're, they're, there are a couple reasons here. Well, one reason that's divided up into two things. He says, what I want to give you is, I want to give you the, the tablets of stone. Well, that's the Ten Commandments and the law. So he's giving him, that's what we've been talking about, about the commandments are not the law. They were a part of the law. They were the foundation for the law. So he says, I'm going to give you these stone tablets that have those commandments on them, but I'm going to give you more. I'm going to give you what this law is. And the reason is, is because now that these people are in this relationship, they need more. They need to know more. They need to grow more. And so I want you to, I want you to get this so that you can teach it to others. Yeah. I just find it interesting that God here is now giving them the law that they have already signed their lives away to. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Verse 13. So Moses arose with his assistant, Joshua. And Moses went up to the mountain of God, and he said to the elders, Wait here for us until we come back to you. Indeed, Aaron and Hur are with you. If any man has a difficulty, let him go to them. So we've got a couple more names now. Now we've got Joshua, who obviously, if he's been brought up uh, with this group, then he's one of the 70. And we have Hur, who's mentioned here that we haven't been reading about who's also got to be one of the 70 because they've already been separated from the nation, uh, the group of people that represent the nation itself. So Joshua goes with Moses further. He's some kind of an assistant here, and he will get more prominent as time moves forward. It is clear that he distinguishes himself as a very courageous, as a great leader. And so this is an opportunity for him to assist Moses. But even he won't go as far as Moses will go here. But he leaves Aaron and his sons and the rest of the 70, along with her, who evidently has also distinguished himself around the people. And here's why. Well, God knows they're going to be afraid. You know, Moses has kind of represented God to the people. When they have a complaint, they didn't go to God. They went to Moses. And they asked Moses to go to God. When God speaks to the people, they turn to Moses and say, look, you go talk to him and you come tell us what to do because we're afraid of him. So he has kind of represented God to the people. And so at this point, as Moses is leaving, God knows that the people are going to be afraid. And so he leaves behind these specific leaders in order to help the people get through this time of challenge that's coming while Moses is on the mountain for what will end up being 40 days. Yeah, I um, just want to add that, although this isn't the point of this passage, that this is a pivotal turning point 
in the story of Joshua, that from here on out, when we read about Joshua, Joshua is represented and written as a type of Christ, that he is representative of what Christ will come and do. So this idea that Moses is the one who goes between him and God starts to transition to that Joshua is also fulfilling this sort of role. Okay, verse 15. Then Moses went up into the mountain, and a cloud covered the mountain. And now the glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. If we stop there, if you kind of try to keep it in his timeline, it appears that Moses has told you know, Joshua to come with him, and he's told Aaron and her and the rest of them to stay, to try to be there for the people. And Moses and Joshua have begun their climb up to the peak of the mountain, but somewhere along the way up, they don't go any further because the cloud comes down on the mountain. And they wait, and they wait, and they wait, and they wait for six days, and there's cloud, and there's fire, and, you know, the people in the valley are afraid. And finally, after six days, God calls Moses to go deeper into the cloud. And, and that's where Joshua stays. Again, we see the representation of the seventh day being an important thing. But also here, I think that Moses is going through some sort of purifying process during these six days, whether it be fasting or prayer and meditation or all of the above, that God is preparing Moses to be able to go up higher on the mountain. And likewise, we have to be prepared to go before God. Yes. Okay, 17. The sight of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on the top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. So Moses went into the midst of the cloud and went up into the mountain, and Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. Now, we learn a lot later about, well, maybe not a lot, I guess, but we learn later that Moses uh, passed during this time frame as he's before God. Uh, and we're going to start from this point forward and start reading about all the things that he learned uh, and that was recorded while he was on this mountain. The events uh, that follow are going to directly connect to this period of time that Moses is up on this mountain with God. And this is where he's giving him all of the details of what it means for these people who have entered into this covenant to stay there. You know, they've entered in. Now you've got to live like it and stay there. And so Moses is all by himself in the presence of God, and all the people in the valley around the mountain are afraid because of God's awesome holiness and power that they are, they are now seeing the, an example of. Yeah, I like here the language in describing what this looked like from the camps below. The sight of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on the top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. All this language here implies that this is not what it actually looked like, but what God presented it to them as. That obviously God was not going to allow them to see what was really happening. They could not see God. They could not see Moses. They had no clue what was going, but God gave them this spectacular imagery of fire and embers and all-consuming fire, something similar to what he's been doing the past couple chapters that we've read. Okay, uh, that's all we're supposed to cover according to the schedule tonight. Uh, next Wednesday night, we will be in chapter 25 and 26 and 27. So we have three chapters to cover next Wednesday night. Uh, and you'll be joining us at that point in time. Uh, we'll cover those chapters, Exodus 25, 26, and 27. Thank you for joining us in tonight's class, and uh, we'll close with a prayer. Let us pray. Dear Lord, our Father, we are so thankful for this opportunity that we have, that although we are separated at this time, we can come together and study your word with one another, that we can look into the examples that you've given us and find ways that we can better serve you, better become keepers of your word, Lord. We ask you to be with us as we go into your word always, that we apply it to our lives, that we apply it right and do justice by it, Lord, that you're always with us and give us the strength and encouragement to teach it to others. It's in your son's holy name we pray. Amen.